Oh hey, welcome back to the basement. In this video, we're going to talk about my base setup for pretty much all Raspberry Pi Zero projects. I'll step you through the whole entire process of setting it up without a keyboard or a monitor. We're going to do it all from a Windows machine. We'll get it on the internet, we'll get it sharing files over the network, we'll turn it into a USB thumb drive, and more. Before we start though, please make sure you open my Instructable write-up to go along with this. This video is geared toward people who are new to the Raspberry Pi. If you're an advanced user, you're probably just going to want to skip around or maybe even go straight to the Instructable for reference. Anyways, I love using Raspberry Pi Zeros in projects, but there's a lot of setup before you can actually integrate them into anything. My goal here is to walk you through that setup, and then when we're done, we'll make a backup of the SD card so you can be up and running on new projects within 15 minutes. This whole tutorial is going to be for people using Windows. You can certainly do all this stuff from Linux or Mac OS, but I don't use those machines as my daily drivers, so I don't know how to do this on those. That being said, most of the setup is actually on the Raspberry Pi, and the rest you could just look up how to do what I'm showing on your particular operating system. So this video and Instructable will still be a good reference for you as well. I should also note that this whole process is for Raspberry Pi Zero, not a Zero W. In the future, I plan on making a separate video for the W, so for now, we're just going to be dealing with Raspberry Pis that don't have any kind of wireless features. So alright, let's get into it. Before we could start setting anything up, we're going to need a lot of software, so first let's download and install everything. We'll use Etcher for copying disk images and backups onto SD cards. Speaking of disk images, let's go ahead and get the latest version of Raspbian Lite. Before we image new SD cards, we're going to want to format it with SD Card Formatter. This is kind of a formality, but why not be safe? To connect over SSH once the Raspberry Pi is running, we'll use an app called Putty. This is going to sound strange, but we're also going to install the Apple Bonjour Print Services. This is useful because you can find your device by hostname and not have to find its IP address on the network. And finally, we're going to grab Win32Disk Imager. We're going to use this for backing up our SD card once it's set up the way we like. Now that you have everything downloaded, go ahead and pause this video and install all of it. Speaking of pausing, this video is going to move at lightning speed. The key to getting through it is going to be pausing as you wait on things to finish or if you get stuck on something. You can always go back to the Instructable to read in more detail what I'm talking about. Also, before you get started, you should always use as small a card as possible for this process. Something like an 8 or a 16 gig card is fine. You can always image an 8 gig card image to a 32 gig card and expand your file system in Rasby config. But if you make an image based off a 32 gig card, you can't image that onto an 8 or a 16 gig card later. Now we're going to pop the micro SD card into the computer and set that up. I always start by formatting the SD card with the SD card formatter app. Now let's extract the Raspbian image so we can write it to the SD card using Etcher. This app is super easy to use. Just choose your uncompressed disk image, choose your SD card, and then click flash. When Etcher is done flashing, you should see two new drives show up. If you don't, remove your SD card and put it back in. One of those drives will be labeled boot, and the other one probably won't have a label. If Windows complains about the other drive not being formatted properly, just ignore it. It's a Linux partition, so Windows can't read it. So now let's pre-configure Linux before we put it in the Raspberry Pi and boot it. You'll see I'm using VS Code here, but all we're doing is making text files, so you can use anything you like. First we're going to make a totally empty file named ssh with no file extension. You may have to tell Windows to show file extensions and stop hiding them so that you could see that it's not adding like a dot text to the end or something like that. With this file in place, when the Linux operating system boots, it will automatically run an ssh server for us to connect to. We're also going to need a way to communicate with this Raspberry Pi. It doesn't have any kind of wireless, so we're going to have to create some kind of a network ourselves. We'll do this by editing the config.txt file. Scroll all the way to the bottom of the file and add an entry for the DWC2 overlay. That will enable us to use the USB OTG functionality on the Pi. Next, open commandline.txt. Scroll all the way to the end of the first line and add an entry to load modules for DWC2 and Gether. You have to be careful in this file because you want to space before and after every new set of commands you add. And I always leave the last line blank, which should be the second line. The DWC2 module should do like we said and enable the USB OTG functionality. 
Then we load the GEther module, which creates a virtual Ethernet device on the USB port. That's what we're going to use to connect to from Windows. Alright, we're finally ready for our first boot. Pull the SD card out of the computer, pop it into the Raspberry Pi, and connect the Raspberry Pi to the computer with a USB cable going into the centermost USB port. The outside USB port is only connected to power. In this case, we want to use the Raspberry Pi as a USB device on a computer. While this boots, pop open the Device Manager in Windows. You can do this easily by clicking the Start menu and typing out Device Manager. Once that's up, Open the network adapters and watch for a USB Ethernet RNDIS gadget to appear. Now that you have an Ethernet adapter connected over USB, we can finally try connecting to the Raspberry Pi. Run PuTTY and under the host name type raspberrypi.local, then click Open. If this doesn't work and you haven't restarted since you installed Bonjour, give Windows a restart and try it again. If it does work, you'll get a PuTTY security alert. Just click Yes to connect. Now we can log in. We'll use a default login of Pi and a password of Raspberry. Nice, so that's a big step. You're now connected to your Raspberry Pi. Now we need to configure our permanent USB OTG setup. What we've done so far is temporary. As a side note, a lot of the rest of this is going to be copy and pasting things from the Instructable into PuTTY. Pasting in the PuTTY is easy. All you have to do is right click on the terminal. Open the modules file, scroll to the bottom, and add DWC2. Then hit Ctrl X, choose Yes, and hit Enter. Now we're going to create a partition for a drive inside of a file called pyusb.bin. Once that's done, we'll format the partition to be a FAT32 DOS partition. That way Windows can read and write to it. We'll create a folder to mount that to inside of Linux. And then we'll go into FS tab and make a new entry for the partition. Once again, to save your file changes in the Nano Text Editor, press Ctrl X, choose Yes, and hit Enter to save. Go ahead and mount that new drive just to make sure you don't get any errors. Then we're going to edit RC Local. Here we're going to add scripts to wait 5 seconds after boot, start the G Multi module, and give it our partition file, and then mount that same partition on the Linux side in read only mode. The G Multi module is interesting. It enables use of multiple USB OTG devices at the same time. In this case, we're going to be using the mass storage device to provide a thumb drive for Windows, and the same Ethernet device we were using earlier, all in one module. Note here that we're making the Windows side of the drive writable, and the Linux side of the drive read-only. You can't have both of them writable at the same time, unfortunately. But you can switch it to be Linux writable, Windows read-only if you want to drop logs or something for Windows. If you'd rather it work that way instead, you can refer to the Instructable for that update. Since we're going to be using gmulti for our Ethernet adapter, we have to go back into commandline.txt and remove the original gether that we added earlier. And now let's reboot the Raspberry Pi to see all the new modules kick in on the Windows side. As we wait for the Raspberry Pi to reboot, let's talk about how it works with Windows. Unfortunately, the G Multi module seems to be a little bit weird. Nothing that'll stop it from working, but things you have to get used to. One example of that is when the Raspberry Pi initially starts, Windows won't recognize the device. And then five seconds later, the scripts we added will kick in, which will bring up the Ethernet adapter and the thumb drive. Also, pretty much every time the thumb drive comes up, Windows is going to say it needs to be scanned for errors. I've never been able to make this stop happening, and I've also never seen errors develop on the drive. In general, if you don't unplug the Raspberry Pi while you're writing to that drive, it should be fine. So let's open up that USB drive and try making a test file. We'll read that file from Linux a little bit later. Another quirk with this is that Windows won't detect the Ethernet adapter like it did the first time. This is easy to fix though, and you'll only have to do this once per machine. Pop open the device manager like we did earlier. This time, you'll see an RNDIS device with a warning on it. Right click on that and choose Update Driver. Then browse computer for software and let me pick. Now show all devices. This will take a second to come back, but when it does, scroll down on manufacturer and choose Microsoft. Then under model, you're going to want to choose remote NDIS compatible device. Then click next and say yes. Now you should have an ethernet connection again like before. So the next step is to make sure your Raspberry Pi is connected to the internet. For that, we're going to be using Windows built-in internet connection sharing. You should only have to do this once as well. To get started, click the start menu and type network status. 
Once that opens, scroll down a bit and choose Change Adapter Options. On this window, you should see the Raspberry Pi Ethernet adapter and the adapter you use to connect to the internet. Right click on the adapter you connect to the internet with and choose Properties. Now click the Sharing tab and choose Allow other network users to connect through this computer's internet connection. Finally, select your Raspberry Pi's Ethernet adapter from the drop down. With all that done, let's go back to PuTTY and log back into the Raspberry Pi. Now we'll test the internet connection. To do this, the first thing I usually do is ping Google's DNS servers. After the first time I've set up internet connection sharing, I usually have to restart the Raspberry Pi. As you can see, we're not on the internet yet, so let's do that now. We're getting close. We're about two-thirds done. Once it finishes booting and you see the thumb drive appear, reconnect with PuTTY and let's test that internet connection again. Just like before, I'm going to ping 8.8.8.8, and that comes back, so now let's ping google.com. Perfect. So now that we're online, let's update our apt-get repositories first. Then we'll do a little house cleaning in the Raspberry Pi config. First thing we'll do is update the default user password. Then we'll customize the host name so this doesn't get confused with any other Raspberry Pis on the network. At this point, the Raspberry Pi will have to restart to change your host name. Again, once that comes back up, connect using PuTTY, but this time make sure you use the new host name and your new password. The last thing we have to set up is Samba file sharing. That way you can access your Linux files from Windows. First we'll add the Avahi daemon service to start up. Then we'll make an AFPD service file and add some configuration to it. Once you've saved that, restart the Avahi daemon. And now we'll install Samba, which is the actual file sharing service. At some point, it's going to ask if you want to modify your config. Just say no. This can be a pretty long process, but once it's done, the first thing we should do is update our Samba password. And finally, we'll configure Samba to share our home directory with all rights enabled. As with everything else, just get this block of text from Instructable and right click to paste. And with that last bit done, you are finally done configuring things. Restart the Raspberry Pi and let's test it out. Once the thumb drive comes back up, let's try accessing Linux through file sharing. When you get the security prompt, your login is going to be pi, and your password is whatever you set earlier. At this point, you may see two shares. Honestly, I'm not sure where the source share comes from, but both of them work. Open one, and let's make a test file on there, just like we did on the thumb drive. Then we'll connect through PuTTY one last time, and make sure we can read both of these files. First we'll check the file in the home directory, then we'll check the file on the jump drive. There is a caveat about accessing jump drive files from Linux. Linux will only see new files every time you remount the drive. There's a workaround where you can unmount and remount that drive quickly, and I'll provide a script for that on the Instructable. Alright, let's shut down the Raspberry Pi, pop the SD card into the computer, and finally back up this image so we can reuse it later. This part is going to be really easy. Run Win32DiskImager, give your disk image a name, choose one of the two drives that come from your SD card, make sure you click Read Only a Located Partitions, and then click Read. It's worth noting here that the disk image you're generating is going to be about the size of the disk it's based off of. This is a huge waste of space. So the next thing I do is compress these into either a zip or a RAR file set to best compression. In this case, my compressed file ends up being like 6% the original image. So that's it. You now have a Raspberry Pi that's connected to your computer. It's on the internet. It works like a thumb drive. It does a lot of stuff, and you backed up the SD card image. That's important because when you start new projects, you can just re-image your new SD cards, just like we did in the beginning of this video, with your backup of the SD card instead of Raspbian. That way, when you start new projects, you can fast forward to this point on every new project. That's also nice because if you wreck your card or your operating system for some reason, you can just re-image a new card and start over. There are some weird caveats to using this as a thumb drive, granted, but none of them should hold you back that much. I wouldn't use it as a replacement for a real USB thumb drive, but if you are on a computer that doesn't have all the drivers and stuff set up for this, it's super convenient to be able to copy files over or edit code, things like that. 
I didn't go into a lot of detail on accessing the thumb drive files from Linux, but that's kind of a big subject, so I figured we'll cover that in another video. This one is already too long. So all right, you made it through the whole video, nice. Hopefully you ended up with a Raspberry Pi that is going to save you a lot of time in the future and help kickstart your new projects. If you had any problems, the first thing I would do is go through the instructable step by step and make sure you didn't miss anything. If that doesn't work out, please leave a message and we'll see if we can work out your problems. I'd also love to hear your suggestions for making the setup better, maybe faster, or if you just build anything with it, that'd be awesome to hear about too. So that's it. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.